Well, I would like to introduce this morning uh, the founding director of the uh, Baker Institute, uh, Ambassador Edward Derision, and uh, he has had a long and distinguished uh, service record with the uh, State Department and served as the ambassador to Syria, ambassador to Israel, and also served as the Under Secretary of State for the Middle East, and I think has provided great uh, visionary leadership for the Baker Institute and made it, I think, the institute it is today. So. Let me present to you uh, Ambassador Derision. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what's more challenging, space exploration or resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, but I think it's an even contest. <laughs> I would like to welcome you all to the uh, James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy and to Rice University for the International Space uh, Medicine Summit an event that we are truly uh, proud to co-sponsor with the Baylor College of uh, Medicine. For many of you, uh, this is your third International Space uh, Medicine Summit, and we are delighted uh, to have you back. I particularly want to welcome our international participants uh, who have come a long way to be with us, and especially our new attendees from China. We are very pleased to have you with us, and we hope that this will be the first of many future visits uh, to the Baker Institute. The summit has proven to be a forum very much in keeping with the goals of this institute, uh, an event committed to intellectual excellence that bridges the divide between the world of action and the world of ideas. And it accomplishes this on an international uh, scale. Look around and you will see physicians, space biomedical scientists, researchers, astronauts, and cosmonauts from all over the world. We have gathered to discuss freely and openly the medical and biomedical challenges of long duration space flights, as well as the issues facing our ongoing and future joint activities in space. I am also pleased to see that this year's summit addresses the education of our young people and the importance of developing a new generation of engineers and scientists that will take us to new horizons. This past November, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the International Space Center, Station, the largest spacecraft ever built. The orbital assembly of the space station began with the launch from Kazakhstan of its first component, Zarya, on November 20th, 1998. A few weeks later, the Space Shuttle Endeavour carried aloft the Unity model, module the space shuttle crew, which included a Russian cosmonaut, joined Unity and Zarya together in space in what marked the beginning of a long and fruitful international collaboration. Ten years later, the station's mass had expanded to more than 627,000 pounds, and its interior volume is more than 25,000 cubic feet, comparable to the size of a five-bedroom house. Some 167 individuals representing 14 countries have been to the space station where they have eaten approximately 19,000 meals. Now that's an impressive number, but I'm not too sure about how many Michelin stars their meals will get. When it is completed next year, the space station will represent the largest international cooperative technological project in history. That's quite an accomplishment. Its completion, however, comes at a time of great uncertainty in the United States space program. The U.S. space shuttle, scheduled to make its last flight in 2010, is an essential element in the construction and operation of the space station because of its large upmass and downmass cargo capability. In a Baker Institute report earlier this year, Senior fellows Dr. Neil Lane and George Abbey and Rice lecturer John Martare called for enhancing support for the space pro station. They recommended establishing a clear rationale for the station based on continued international cooperation, the peaceful uses of space, and scientific research. The Baker Institute report also proposed 
that the Space Shuttle program be extended to 2015 in order to sustain the space station. Additionally, any efforts to explore Mars should be restructured to include international partners building on our relationship from the space station. I'm happy to note that last week the White House ordered a complete outside review of NASA's manned space program. An independent panel will look at the design of the new spacecraft to replace the space shuttle and go to the moon, as well as the five-year gap between the shuttle's current proposed retirement and the new moon vehicles. The review will also look at extending NASA's use of the International Space Station beyond 2016. I am hopeful that this planned review will bring a sense of direction to our program, a direction that will continue to support and enhance international cooperation. So meetings such as this summit can go a long way to further that cooperation. I've been very impressed by the previous two meetings and the openness and the quality of the discussions. And I am looking forward to a summit that will continue to set the standard for such deliberations. Again, I want to welcome all of you and wish you a very successful session. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
express your name before you uh, ask your question or make your comments uh, because that's uh, uh, important for identification. We ask you to sign an, uh, a uh, permit uh, permit form for uh, uh, the uh, video uh, taping of the of the summit. Uh, each of you will receive it's probably in late June, early July, a complete set of the uh, of those recordings uh, for you to have uh, for your records. The uh, I think that that covers most all the things I wanted to uh, uh, mention to you. You may wonder about the reserve seats on the first row. There are some panels that are larger than six. Uh, members and uh, we're having uh, those panelists sit on the front row in those seats so they can get ready access to the microphone to make their comments uh, and so that's the reason for it actually we probably only need a maximum of uh, four of those seats uh, but at times we perhaps won't uh, need any and sometimes only one or two so that uh, I call your attention to those seats on the front row and in, in that part of the um, lecture hall. Uh, with that, um, I think I've covered all the all the materials. I do want to encourage you to complete the evaluation form that you were given with your registration packet, and uh, you'll have one of those for each day that you're here. And they do help us uh, critically review the program and think about. Uh, what we can do to make improvements in it. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for being here once again. And uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Davis, if you would uh, present the panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alford. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier, uh, who will moderate the panel. Uh, Bill began his career with NASA in 1977 at what was then called the NASA Lewis Research Center. Uh, by 1995, he was the Shuttle Mir Program's Operation Manager, serving as the primary interface to the Russian Space Agency for operational issues. By 1998, he was the Manager of Space Shuttle Program Integration, and by 2002, had been named the Manager of the International Space Station Program. Mr. Gerstenmeier is currently serving at NASA Headquarters as Associate Administrator, Space Operations Mission Directorate, where he has oversight of both the International Space Station and Space Shuttle programs. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University in 1977 and a Master of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo in 1981. He is a Fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So please join me this morning in welcoming Mr. Bill Gerstemeyer. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, what we'll do for the panel is I'll kind of open a couple of little remarks, very short, and then I'll ask each one of the panel members to talk for maybe two, three, four, five minutes, whatever they feel comfortable about, and they'll talk about Space Station and, and what their experiences are with Space Station. We're, we're very lucky to have a very distinguished panel here. We have uh, astronauts that have flown on board Space Station, uh, cosmonauts that have flown in space, we have operations personnel, so we have a good variety of folks that have been involved in Space Station, so it'll be interesting to hear their perspectives on the, the 10 years of uh, Space Station. Um, in the opening remarks, uh, they talked about this magnificent spacecraft we built in orbit, and for those of us that have been with the program since the very beginning, when you see the images, it's amazing to us. Uh, it's been through many fits and starts. Uh, there's been many problems, both technical, political, many discussions to get this spacecraft put together. But somehow through the, all those turmoils and all those tribulations, the thing that kept us moving forward was the, the humans working together as a team and realizing the potential of Space Station. So I think it's appropriate today that we reflect back on those 10 years a little bit. But I don't think we, I want to dwell on that very much. What got us here was that future of what we could do with the space station. 
So as we reflect back on it, we can learn from those lessons, but we ought to quickly project those into the future and figure out how we're going to use this space station as effectively as we can, because it off offers us tremendous opportunities in the medical area, engineering area, operations area. It can be a true test bed and that first step in exploration as we go beyond low Earth, low Earth orbit. So we'll, we'll talk about those things, we'll think about those things, and when you see the hardware and you think about what's really occurred, it's amazing that it's there. You think about the simple meals, you think about about the times when Columbia occurred and uh, it was very tough keeping space station crew during those time frames without the shuttle when it went away but again that was good experience it will allow us for this next period when the shuttle retires to, to operate space station in an effective manner so so with that I'll turn it over to the panel members I'll let each one of them talk for a couple minutes and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for, for your questions and we can uh, interact with you so Milt okay uh, uh, good morning uh, Milt Heflin uh, first of all, I'd, I think I may be the only one who hadn't flown in space here. Is that right, or close to it, or I don't know. So I'm, I'm an ops guy. Um, I, I, I got to say something other than space station to begin with. Um, uh, having served in a flight as a flight controller and flight director in mission control, the, the the highlight of my career was the lead flight director for the very first servicing mission for Hubble, STS-61, back in 1993. In our audience today is the gentleman who torqued the bolt too tight <laughs> on the wide field planetary camera, causing the uh, crew to have difficulty backing that bolt out yesterday. Thank goodness that they got it out and didn't break it. Otherwise, that Jeff Hoffman uh, from the STS-61 uh, crew. So, I, I, I <laughs> do I get to say something in my defense? <laughs> <laughs> Two things. First of all, we used a different kind of torque limiter, and, and we followed what they told us to. But I think the real problem is that with pick 2 like all of us who have been in space, just doesn't want to come home. <laughs> it did its best. Very good, Jeff. It was, it was a pleasure to see you. Uh, let, me brief, let me briefly give you my uh, perspective of the 10 years of space station and so forth. I served as the chief of the flight director office during... Uh, during the the, build, the beginning of the buildup of this, and and it, and one of the things I get to do is I get to take people through mission control today. Um, I, in fact, I love to go over there and no longer work there, uh, but I do love to go over there and take people through the place. And one of the things I tell them when I talk about space station is I think a legacy of the space station um, will be related to what I refer to as, it, this is truly a zero gravity United Nations. It, it, you stop and think about it, it is a zero gravity United Nations. And I tell people it works a hell of a lot better than the one on the ground. <laughs> and I really do believe that. I think we have learned, to, uh, to me the legacy of it, it's not just what we've done technically to get this thing built, and that's remarkable, it's the fact that we have learned how to take the, the people culture, the space culture, and each of these uh, um, countries and blend them together to do this job. And, and that, to me, I think is um, will be a legacy of this and will help us go beyond lower Earth orbit someday. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from today, and I'll turn it over to Leroy. Okay. Thank you, Milt. Well, good morning, everyone. Wow. Ten years. It's hard for me to believe that the uh, station program is already ten years old. It really seems literally like last week when I was living on board the station, when in fact it's been a little bit over four years. Uh, as I look back over my 15-year flying career at NASA, uh, there is no doubt that the space station, my space station mission on Expedition 10 was the pinnacle and the culmination of all my uh, previous flights and, uh, and my career. Uh, prior to the space station mission, I'd flown three times on shuttles for a, a total accumulated time in space of just over 30 days. And I went into my mission, my space station mission, thinking I knew what it was like to uh, live in space, live and work in space. And uh, even though others had told me before I didn't believe them, I, I, I was pretty sure I knew how to extrapolate my experiences, but I was wrong. And I learned a whole lot about operating in long duration environment. And from a space biomedical uh, perspective, certainly things are much different on a long duration flight. Two weeks just isn't enough for your body to equilibrate and for things to kind of settle out. You know, I learned things like that the fluid shift eventually does settle out and you do lose that, uh, that full-headed feeling. Uh, there are a lot of other more subtle changes that uh, the researchers in this room can tell you about. Uh, you really don't lose weight in space unless you want to, or unless Expedition 9 eats your food. 
oh, they tell me someday I'll laugh about it. You know, but, you know four years isn't quite enough time yet, I guess. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I uh, you know, every uh, every space program, every nation that has undergone space exploration, and there have only been uh, three right now, uh, has done it in a logical stepwise sequence. And space station, people can argue about the need for a space station or why do we need a space station. But it's clear that it's the next step to go on to longer duration missions, whether, you know, a moon base and, and on to Mars. Um, not only operations and science that, and research that's important, but also one part that's often overlooked is just the hardware aspect. We are learning so much from our space station experience on how to build more robust spacecraft. How do we build a, a lunar base that's going to be more robust than the, uh, than the ISS? What do we need to do to you know, build a robust spacecraft that can go to Mars? Because we don't have the luxury of only being, uh, you know, being able to send spares up into orbit or even to the moon. You know, once you're on your way to Mars, you pretty much got what you packed. Um, you know, I'd also like to echo what Milt just said. The, uh, uh, I have to admit, in the, in the beginning of the international effort, uh, I was a bit of a skeptic. You know, I wasn't sure that this was the right path to go down. But uh, having trained in other countries and worked with other astronauts and cosmonauts, uh, I think the most valuable lesson or the most valuable thing coming out of the ISS program is this global experience and the fact that we can all come together here, as Milt said, kind of as a, a mini UN, you know, that works a whole lot better. Along those lines, I'd like to uh, uh, make note that this year we do have a delegation from China uh, visiting from their uh, manned space program, the uh, Astronaut Center in China, uh, led by the director of the center, Dr. Uh, Sangwan Chen. And uh, he's brought two researchers with him, Dr. Uh, Yinghuang Li and Dr. Jin, Li Jin Wang, and uh, also a, a fellow from their uh, foreign affairs office, Jason Liu. So I'd, I encourage you all to, to seek these people out and uh, talk to them, see what, they're, uh, see what they're working on, exchange some ideas. Uh, that's what this week's all, re weekend's really all about. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop now and turn it over to Michael. Thank you. I'm Michael Fole. Um Basically, I started off as a physicist in, in Britain, um, wanting to become an astronaut. I've always, I still see myself as a physicist, although uh, at the time when I first set my eyes on the heavens and thinking about uh, going into space when the Apollo moon landings were taking place, which I think were the greatest achievements of the previous century, uh, my father was a Royal Air Force pilot targeting the Soviet Union and, and other communist nations um, with his weapons. Um, and I had no idea that I might one day uh, not only be a good physicist, but actually be able to speak um, another language, Russian in particular, um, but also act as a, in somewhat as, a, as an ambassador on board the International Space Station uh, with other countries working together to produce this fantastic feat in space. Uh, I think the, the, the greatest achievement last, last century was the Apollo program. Um, the next greatest achievement was the International Space Station Partnership. And uh, it's extraordinary what uh, has been achieved in space. One program which I think was not sustainable was Apollo. Uh, and I think that was because it was a national program. That's a, 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 a proposition I'll put out to everybody to discuss. I believe the space station, though not as efficient or effective maybe in the technical sense of just getting to the moon, or getting to, uh, to the space to make an, an orbitary, uh, orbiting laboratory, nonetheless is a very, very sustainable project because of the vast interest that other countries have in maintaining it with other countries as partners. So I think there's a sustainability issue that is very profound when you do an international project, and it helps you. It's a, it may not be the reason for doing the project, but it certainly is a, a glue that keeps it going. It's a Cynically, you could say it's a bureaucracy that won't, you know, stop moving in a certain direction. Um, I like to think about the future, uh, specifically about exploration. Um, and to date, I think our discussions about exploring beyond Earth orbit have not involved, have not involved a strong international co collaboration. Uh, when I talk to Russian cosmonauts, uh, um, in Russia and also managers there in, in Roscosmos, uh, they agree with me when I talk to them informally and we wonder about what's going to happen uh, next. There should be some kind of common goal to which we all strive uh, as nations to achieve uh, something that's of interest, useful to all nations that would allow us to explore beyond Earth orbit. I personally am going to give a, a, an idea that um, 
uh, is not in any way sanctioned by, by, by my management. <laughs> That's the best kind. <laughs> but nothing, <and> <laughs> nothing new here. It, M Michael's been known for this, so gonna, it, it's no big I'm deal. I'm going to take this opportunity while I have it. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an idea that uh, basically we need something that everyone has self-interest in um, and I think builds on the lesson we learned from the Columbia tragedy, which is functional redundancy between nations in getting to or from space is very, very useful to each individual program. And specifically, I'm referring to the fact that the U.S. could not have achieved continuous uh, inhabitation of the space station without the Russian partner providing that functional redundancy to us when the uh, space shuttle was not flying. And indeed, one day, uh, God forbid, but maybe the U.S. will provide that assistance to another nation trying to maintain its program uh, beyond Earth orbit in exploration. So to achieve this, I think the most important key point is to have um, a common safe haven uh, at the L1 point or around that gravitational equilibrium point between the Earth and the Moon. Specifically, the, uh, uh, that safe haven point is not somewhere you, where you would inhabit it permanently, but it could be a fuel base, it could be an air base, an oxygen base, um, but it would have the docking adapters that allow each nation to save the other during or part of an abort from the lunar surface back to the Earth or on the way out towards an asteroid uh, beyond the Moon or on the way out to Mars. Depending on which path a nation took, they would use this uh, safe haven point between the Earth and the Moon as their, as their um, insurance for certain mission phases uh, where they don't have to carry so much material to cover themselves if they had no other partner. I can go into details, but that's not enough time here. Um, so I would call this an international sort of lunar safe haven or lunar haven. Um, the idea I think of is that it would not be permanently habitable because of this com the issues that this uh, conference and symposium will discuss, and that is radiation. Uh, radiation at the L1 point is going to be very, very severe. In fact, any station away from the uh, protection of the Earth's um, magnetic field and geomagnetic field is going to be severely challenged by radiation, as would a mission to Mars. Um, I'd like to point to a, an experiment that's going to be launched, I hope, next year. Uh, it's called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. That is a physics experiment, uh, a, a particle detector that involves about 150 different scientists, uh, 18 different nations, including China and Taiwan working together uh, uniquely in this instrument, uh, led by Dr. Samuel Ting, um, who is a Nobel laureate. There is much uh, agreement and discourse and disagreement about what science it will produce, but it will measure, it's able to measure a whole range of particles that come from the universe, um, from the galaxy and beyond the galaxy. And these particles have very, very high energies, but they can be, but what I'm telling you is we, they're generally called cosmic rays, but we do not know the general character of these particles. And the alpha magnetic spectrometer will be uh, installed on the space station to measure uh, these particles the way a CERN detector would, um, at the supercollider, for example. My point here is that then we will start to learn about not only maybe just uh, how bad this, this radiation is for li humans living beyond the protection of the Earth's geomagnetic field, but we may also discover some fundamental physics using the space station as an observation platform. Uh, indeed, I think cold dark matter may be uh, detected using a detector like this. Um, and, 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 other, and for example, there may be some indications of uh, what we call dark energy as well. Uh, observed by this detector. That's enough for me. That's my vi vision of the future. I hope that I will be uh, joining with some of us in planning a mission, a joint international mission um, beyond Earth orbit. I won't say to the lunar surface or to Mars or to the asteroids. That's for other for people to decide. But on the way past our, our international lunar safe haven. Thanks. Boris. Good morning, everybody. Please allow me to speak in Russian. I would like to share my experience, my impressions of this important 
anniversary. Uh, сначала несколько слов о том, что At мы first, words, uh, все-таки начали работать вместе на мире. Uh, on the fact that we actually started working on the MIR together. MIR Shuttle и MIR NASA. MIR Shuttle, MIR NASA uh, program. Очень много дала нам. Gave us a lot. Uh, в, взаимопонимание. In a sense of mutual understanding. Подходов. A creation of new approaches. Совместных к решению проблем. Joint decisions of issues. Научным исследованием. А также research, самое главное, что мы знали друг друга, и очень многие работали вместе в течение нескольких лет. Я хочу напомнить, что был очень трудный период, период первый период, период uh, международной космической станции, когда она летала в непилотируемом режиме, и Uh, было три экспедиции, And we had, чтобы uh, поддержать uh, uh, пилотируемую часть station, uh, Международной космической станции. И все с нетерпением ждали, когда будет uh, в состоянии станции finally, модуль, модуль звезда, the звезда module, will uh, dock to the station. жилой отсек космической станции. Вы помните, что You remember uh, we had some Proton. drawbacks in Proton mission, mission. and we uh, worked in extreme uh, tense situation when ISS was того, supposed to fly, ISS crew was supposed to fly uh, after uh, some failures that we had, uh, so the service module uh, finally docked to the International Space Center and the first crew arrived in July 2000, after that the Progress cargo vehicle docked to the station and we finally got our chance to go, this is expedition 2AB, where Этому предшествовали We finally had our crew on. тренировок. Прайд на экипаже, потом экипаж был наш разделен на We на uh, trained for сказать, one year это, and uh, наверное, then the crew was split in two parts. I think I was the most happy when I was there. I was close to полетов в космос, achieving my goal, my dream, flying in space. And this is an important project. international project, and I was a part of it. We all understood миссии. how important our и mission was, and we Я, did everything to train ну, well for it. Теплотой, I am вот, thinking with great экипаже. emotion on the, about the uh, relationship that we had. Вот у нас был Um, within the crew, we had cultural training no, prior to that. Кажется, он, нам, нам I don't think we needed cultural Все training. Actually. Everything went just fine. We worked together. We were motivated highly. Uh, I'm often asked how, what language did we speak. Думаю, And uh, I think it was язык, some kind of new language that we spoke. Иногда ловил себя Because на том, что я sometimes I would start a sentence in English and then I'm using uh, Russian inflections and my American colleagues often used and uh, uh, timely and correctly some Russian words если к этому добавить массу and, uh, аббревиатур, массу специфических терминов, the range of specific terms and abbreviations that we had to work with, Probably somebody who is not familiar with our program, program would not understand what we are talking about and what language. They would not understand either of us, and Americans or Russians. So that was a specific <laughs> language. Maybe we will find a name for this language sometime. Our mission was very important because the service module arrived to the station without quite a few necessary systems to support a human being in space. 2.5 tons of cargo was delivered by Atlantis uh, shuttle and uh, by Progress vehicles. Our task was 
to unload the vehicles, install the systems, and check them out. So to prepare the station so that the new crew will come in and will start working immediately without dealing with any technical issues. We were calling our crew, the brigade of construction workers that just entered the new house to finish it up and prepare for the inhabitants who will actually live there later. And since then, for nine years, we had permanent crew on ISS. Representatives of many countries visited and lived on the station. I think the most important result of this activity is that we are learning to work together. This is not easy at all. Step by step, we develop the command style of management. We are listening to each other. We are finding some ways out of some difficult situations sometimes that happen on the station. And it is important, most important, that both sides, all the sides, support each other. Right now, the situation in the world is not easy. But our government and the government of the United States of America and our colleagues from the EU, from the uh, European uh, Space Agency, everybody confirmed their support to the International Space Program. And of course, flying on ISS, we are looking into the future. And the priority in scientific research, mostly that this is what I am uh, dealing with uh, from the Russian side at the moment, uh, the pri priority is uh, given uh, to the subjects that can be used in intraplanetary missions to Mars, to the Moon. Очень приятно, что and в последнее время получены, я, я думаю, уникальные результаты. Lately we have received the unique results, which was really great news. I don't know if you all are aware of it. We had BioRisk experiment uh, that was completed last year on the International Space Station. We received uh, unique results. We had objects that have been exposed in open space for more than 1.5 years. And uh, those objects were still uh, useful functionally, except for uh, some biological problems and issues that we were trying to resolve in this um, experiment. We received also uh, some great data that is the uh, precedent in um, trying to uh, transport life from planet to planet. This um, uh, subject is also uh, being explored in the experiment which is called EXPOSE. This is an international experience. Uh, we are planning uh, to use uh, biological objects and use them in open space, expose them to radiation and everything. And uh, I think the results that we are getting, as we have received so far, are extremely important for understanding both theoretical, fundamental um, issues, as well as uh, from the point of application of science. And we just uh, started talking about planetary quarantine just now, because uh, quite possibly we will have some, we will find some microorganisms on Mars when we go there. Um, the science is developing, the space science is developing fast. But I think the most interesting here in this area is that we are using a person, a man, a woman, long-duration flights, and in the uh, 
situation of microgravity and research, uh, human research in space. At our institute is also uh, completed by research on using animals, and we believe uh, in the near future we will uh, start uh, uh, using biosputnik uh, programs. You know that at our institute we have uh, an experiment with a long time um, isolation of a human being, which is Mars 500 program. Uh, we will have a separate presentation on that. In general, Space research is continuing. The manned programs are well and developing right now, and each country is participating. And I think when we have a Mars mission, this will be the mission for the whole humanity. And all of us will need to integrate our resources, both material and intellectual and technological resources. And I think uh, this goal will be achieved. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Excuse my voice. I left part of it in the uh, Himalayan mountains last week. So I hope I can be able to talk for uh, a few minutes. Uh, and thank you again. And thank you, George. Thanks to George that have been here for so many years. And um, just insist on the spectacular accomplishment that is the space station seen from uh, uh, foreign countries like mine. This is a, uh, we get used to it. And this uh, international realization, mostly, of course, American and Russian, is shining over our heads. And, uh, and I hope it's shining for many more years. It's a fantastic accomplishment. If you look at what we were doing three decades ago, no one was thinking of anything, even one percent of that. And uh, by privilege of age, I started many years ago, three decades ago, and I passed by Journal Space Center in 1977. I was at that time a test pilot in the French Air Force, and I was in, uh, around Houston to do some test flights and dreaming to go to space one day. And happily, uh, French, uh, uh, France failed the selection of the first astronauts going to join ESA and the uh, Space Lab uh, program. And of course, I was quite frustrated, quite sad. That was at the time when uh, many objects were shining over our heads. And in this country, you just finished the Apollo program. That was such a dream for many of us. Uh, we started. Uh, Space Shuttle and uh, Space Lab, and unhappily again, my country was down, and we just had to forget about uh, going to space. Uh, and uh, sometimes things change very quickly. Our president was so unhappy and was so frustrated <coughs> of the uh, failure of the country to have uh, astronauts selected to uh, go into <coughs> in Houston. You see, probably have to, we have to stop. Um, that uh, we accepted, uh, the president accepted to go to Russia, to the Soviet Union, to uh, train a couple of cosmonauts to go and flying. And then started uh, my space career, and also that's the uh, first initiation to international uh, cooperation. And I came back to uh, 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 Johnson Space Center in 1984 for training for, uh, as a backup uh, astronaut on, uh, on the space shuttle. And at this time, there was no word of international cooperation. Um, we just had visited uh, the Soviet system, where the world, uh, freedom, mir, everything was like, OK, be first and, uh, and fight. And in, in here, we had the mock-up of the Freedom Space Station, which was already a fantastic project. But that was no cooperation. Just Space Lab wasn't. And step by step, uh, I had one, one foot in one country, one foot in the other one, and happily I had only two feet, so I couldn't have the third one in another country. But I, I had that feeling that international, international cooperation wasn't on its way. And even in 1985, I remember working with 
some uh, <coughs> uh, scientists and technicians and engineers here in John Space Center, and we were talking about what was uh, being done in, uh, in Moscow. Now, that was already uh, nothing official, but uh, how do they do this? How do they do that? And uh, some exchange. And then uh, <coughs> one day, George uh, called me. I was uh, after my second flight in, uh, in Russia, and that's when the International Space Station program was being put under the table. And I really was uh, very happy to be given a chance to participate in that program and to move to this country for 15 years and, uh, and finish my career as an American astronaut because um, I got a dual citizenship and uh, remained at NASA as a US astronaut for the last years of my uh, career. And uh, thanks a lot. I hope I, I help on this uh, cooperation. Thank you. Last weekend, I went out and watched the International Space Station fly over, and I couldn't believe how bright it was, how big it is in space, and how, how large it must be to, to look as big as it is from the Earth. Uh, I thought about three crew members up there who are building, maintaining it, doing scientific experiments while they're up there, and I couldn't believe that it's actually doing some of the things that it was designed for. It's a laboratory that we can do things in that we can't do anywhere else. We don't even know all the valuable things that we can do from it. And as I watched it fly over, I thought about not only the, reflected on the things that we have done there, but on its purpose as we go forward. It will help us to prepare to go further outward from our own Earth and its environment. When I was uh, on the International Space Station with Expedition 2, that was a, a long time ago. It wasn't just four years, Leroy. It was a, a long time ago. Uh, I had two other crewmates, uh, Yuri Yusuchov and Susan Helms, and we were a little bit disappointed when we were first assigned. There were a lot of really neat, good things to be doing on that flight, but there was no science, and we all really believed in doing the science on the International Space Station. They didn't plan to do anything. It was only assembly. Well, luckily, before uh, we went, our senior managers at NASA got smarter, Bill, and they decided that we really ought to be doing some science on board, and they made accommodation for that. And we had 17 different experiments during that very early expedition to the space station. Six of those were human research. Uh, I, I remember most of them very clearly. The, the one that we started first was one uh, called H-reflex. It looked at your uh, spinal excitability. And it did that by putting an apparatus on your leg and then shocking it. it they, they said it was kind of like whacking your knee and looking at the response to it, but they wanted it to be very measurable, so instead of us trying to whack each other on the knee, they used an electrical shock for it. it wasn't terribly pleasant to shock your leg. You had to control it yourself, so you made it higher and higher shock, uh, turning a control on a computer, so you'd feel the shock, and then you'd, you'd have to make it worse. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't a great pleasure to do, and that's why we let Susan do it first. <laughs> she, she was a strong woman. Uh, we also looked at other things that I think are the two key things for long duration and going out further into our, our solar system, and that is uh, bone mass loss, which is, definitely affects you, you know, about a percent or one and a half percent uh, a month that you're in microgravity, and radiation. We had three different radiation experiments that looked at the entire radiation field, uh, neutrons, and we had a thing called a phantom torso that was a lot of fun. It, was, it looked like a human torso, and it had uh, various uh, dosimeters buried inside it so that it would measure the actual effect on human tissue and organs that were deep inside your body. And we had fun with that because it was our fourth crew member, and we, <laughs> we let him look around the space station and took some very nice photos with him. But I think that it had uh, the very good scientific value of actually looking at what the radiation effects are on the human body. We had a fourth uh, or a, a sixth experiment that I also think is probably could be the most important aspect of, of the research that we do on human beings in space and that is interactions between each other, the crew members, our team on the ground, uh, to make sure that we have good interactions, that we can handle those things when we're on a very difficult mission and going to the space station is a little bit difficult, and you've got to be able to work with different cultures, different people, uh, people who have different ideas of what's most important for you. And being able to work together and pull together as a team over a long period of time is important. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when we go to Mars, and we, we absolutely, positively must work together for long periods of time 
So the psychological aspects of uh, crew interactions with each other and with their ground teammates is going to be extremely important and we've got to be able to do that right. And so I, I hope that some of our colleagues out there who are interested in that are still pushing to do that type of research for us. We do, we do a lot of looking at the hardware on the International Space Station and uh, looking at how it's going to be better prepared when we go on the longer flights back to the moon, onto Mars, and further exploration of the solar system. But I think it's equally important for us to continue to look at the human beings. They're an important cog in our human spaceflight program, and we've got to make sure that they're going to function properly and they're going to return in good condition when they come back. So I hope all my medical colleagues out there will continue to sponsor and do research and make sure that we're taking care of the human component of our space flight as well. Uh, when I watched the space station fly over, I thought what a fantastic scientific resource it is and I hope we'll continue to use it to gather information and maximize its scientific benefit to us in the long run. <clears throat> I will speak in Russian as well so that you will not be suffering from my accent. I am looking at Charlie Golden who is smiling and remembering 1992 when Sergei Krikalov arrived here for the first time and in Clear Lake. You could not hear Russian language anywhere. At that time Charlie was looking at us and thinking who are those red uh, cosmonauts uh, from other planets. Well, what is important, important is cooperation. The cooperation started uh, coming together as we started working together and we even developed a, a special language, as Boris told us. I am very happy, of course, that uh, I was at Baikonur in 92 on October 20th when the first module of the International Space Station was being launched. I am very happy that uh, it was such a grandiose event that even the skeptics actually were cheering. The activity that we had in Shuttle Mir program when astronauts were flying on the Mir station and cosmonauts were flying on the shuttle allowed us uh, to join the efforts of the people who are both in space and on the ground. Uh, and I'm talking about the mission control operators, engineers, uh, scientists, and curators of, of experiments. So this is all a grandiose experiment, grand experiment. What do we have in orbit right now? We have a great large station uh, that is a product of international cooperation, and uh, right now, uh, just flying to the station and replacing items uh, in, in order to keep the systems going. This is already secondary. What we are going to have there soon, we are going to have the doubled crew, six people crew, and they will be able to fully develop themselves. Uh, devote themselves uh, uh, to science. And this is the um, initial idea of the International Space Station. So finally, we are going to have it as a full scientific laboratory, and I hope for it very much. Uh, and uh, the uh, events that I mentioned I just now, they could be discussed at length. And our conference, of course, is a medical conference. Uh, however, the medicine and the technical uh, goals are very much intertwined. In the first years of the station mission, uh, I was working with the crews. I remember Charlie Bolden being trained when some uh, procedures had to do strictly per uh, uh, documents, step by step. And I am uh, horrified right now by the volume of uh, the knowledge that uh, astronauts are supposed to have in order to perform 
some procedures. They will have to do something within, within uh, four or five minutes. But in order to uh, go through the procedure, they will have to read through the procedure. I think this is incorrect. They should not follow strictly uh, through the procedure. And this is something that the psychologists and engineers both will have to think about it and will have to think about the correct training for the crew. Thank you for your attention. We'll talk about it later. Okay, great. I think we got a couple minutes for some questions, so why don't I open it up and see if there's any questions from the audience and, and, and see. Okay. Yeah, I think most of the panelists commented on the value of international participation going to space. In fact, in the Apollo era, the plaques that are left on the surface of the moon are on the behalf of humanity. However, most national space programs of the spacefaring nations of the world most of the uh, national programs of the spacefaring nations of the world have their own national visions for long-term space exploration. I would put it to the panel, would there be value in having the major spacefaring nations of the world come together and create a long-term vision for space exploration, that all the agencies get together and articulate that vision to help focus the national priorities as the economic environments change and the climates change to anchor our programs so that we can truly set path, uh, footsteps on the path back to the moon and on to Mars. Darn Dave, I thought we did that, don't we Bill? <laughs> That's what we're doing here. <laughs> yeah. I think we didn't do it in a formal sense as Dave described, but we clearly all had our own objectives. Each country had their objective of what they wanted to accomplish for station. And then through all these tough times, we figured out a way that we could all achieve our, our, our goals. And, and I remember very uh, clearly in one of the meetings when we were trying to decide on the assembly sequence with all the international partners sitting around the table with me, we had to decide on a, a series of assembly flights that wasn't optimum for anybody. In fact, it, it was not good from a US perspective. I wasn't allowed to even talk about the other sequences. My Russian colleagues, they had a different sequence. The European colleagues had a different sequence. And we all were defending our own individual pieces. And this was on a Saturday in the Gilruth Center. And finally, my Russian colleagues said, you know, we will never get this done, but we're going to have to rise above our nationalistic interests and figure out what is the right answer for the International Space Station. And I thought, man, what a profound statement that was. So at that point, I said, OK. Let's throw away our badges, let's throw away our nationalities, and let's figure out what the right thing to do is so we can go forward to our politicians in our countries and represent what we're going to do and go forward. And, it, and we couldn't do it that day. And in fact, at the end of the day, I gave them the, the, the decree from the NASA side, this is the ultimate plan we're going to go do that's good for us. And I had the authority to do that. I could actually set policy. And so I tried to set policy, but I looked at them and they all looked so hurt that I said, well, okay, we won't do this. So then I, I met with them all individually on Sunday, and then on Monday we all got together and we had agreed to a plan and we took it forward to our politicians. So we didn't have the big formal plan, but we sure had our own individual goals up front, and we were able to compromise our nationalistic interests to achieve where we are on station. See, just a quick comment on that. I would submit that if the spacefaring nations of the world have not gone beyond low Earth orbit by the 50th anniversary of Apollo, we could probably ask, what have we been doing? And perhaps having this international priority where the spacefaring nations of the world get together and say, we will achieve the following within the next 50 years. We will put humans on Mars. We will go forward and accomplish the following objectives may be of value getting that shared agreement. Yeah, and I would agree. And I, I think also space station is demonstration, at least in my mind, of what you can do with cooperation. We should leverage off a of space station and use it as we go forward with exploration. It's not the perfect construct, but it sure is at least one that worked. And how we, can we take that, amend it where it needs to be amended, and move forward towards the larger goals that you described. Any other questions? Anybody? Yeah, Charlie? I guess a, a question, a comment, kind of going with David and, and um, a follow-up. You know, the scientific community uses, not in space flight isn't scientific, but, but the scientific community uses what's called decadal surveys. And, uh, and, you know, as I have learned, they're like Moses bringing the tablets down from the mountain. For those of you who aren't Christian, it, you know, it's like the law. Um, and it works for them. They use it to defend a lot of things. And over the last few days, um, several people have been wondering if, it's not, if it wouldn't be wise to have, uh, you know, the, the scientific, the human spaceflight scientific community come together and 
come up with a decadal survey. Now, it might not be 10 years because that's, I think that's a short horizon for human spaceflight, but, but maybe 40 years or 30 years or something where we reach international agreement on these are the goals that we want to achieve um, so that everybody's speaking from the same language and you have some, some, you know, some international agreement that you can look at and say, okay, here's what we said 10 years ago, have we done this and what do we need to do to modify that because right now everything's ad hoc and uh, and we get together like this and we we remember things and we reminisce and it's all good but but I think at some point we're gonna have to formalize this stuff or we're never gonna get there that was a kind of a comment from since there are a lot of scientists down there on the panel who also have to be human space so, so, so the panel that, that I'm sure you guys are all shy so do you have any response I, I, Charlie, I just want to say we can't agree even in the United States whether you should go to Mars or the moon. You know, we, we can't figure that out. And I don't think there is a clear cut answer. That's why I think maybe we should go for the minimum goal that people could agree on. Walt Cunningham, <clears throat> I'd like to add a thought to what Charlie said, and that is that in setting goals for international cooperation, we still should not limit ourselves solely to those kind of goals. Within that envelope, uh, you ought to have national kind of goals that people can still pursue, especially if it fits in with the master plan. For example, we shouldn't have, have to, two countries shouldn't have to go solve the same scientific problem as, as long as you can agree on it. And you should still be able to pursue individual or uh, individual countries' goals within that envelope. Yeah, I, I imagine one country may want to go and make a lunar base on the south pole of the moon, and another country may want to go to an asteroid. I mean, so you come up with something that's common to your, to your goals. Okay. Yes, middle. Very young of MIT. I also wanted to follow up on Char Charlie Bolden's comment with respect to a, a decadal survey in human life sciences. In fact, we've been doing those, Charlie. Uh, the... Uh, National Research Council, through its uh, Biological and Life Sciences Committee, has had every 10 years a study of future directions for life sciences in space. But the problem is it takes two to have a conversation. And the scientific community has regularly written what facilities, what experiments take priority. They have been vetted. They have been gone through the NRC, the, uh, NRC and NAS uh, reviews. And then when it comes to spending the money, the operational constraints take over. I mean, I'll, I will mention only one example, the absence on the space station of the centrifuge accommodation module or the animal centrifuge, which one of those decadal surveys that I participated in said was far and above the most important piece of, of apparatus that's needed. So it, somehow it doesn't seem to be given the attention and have the strength that our colleagues in the, uh, in the astronomy community have. Yeah, back in the back. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, you know, we're all here because we already believe in human space flying, but a skeptic might look at this seminar and say, well, this is the 10-year anniversary of the International Space Station, but we've actually been going to space for long durations for 30-plus years, from Skylab through the Salyut series to the Mir, now the ISS. And then, you know, co the international collaboration is a good thing, but, you know, most international business, these, most multinational corporations are really international enterprises. And there are, you know, international co collaboration and alliances like NATO and other places. So what is it that the ISS is doing that's truly unique? Can you capsulize uh, what you think is the unique contribution of the ISS? I think Milt said it. I'm still thinking. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I'm still thinking because I think it's an excellent question, unique. Uh, that's. Well, it's important uh, to move uh, this program forward. Yeah. Sure. Jim? Well, Jay, I think uh, it has unique characteristics about it. You know, of course, the microgravity environment, uh, the very low vacuum that we can use, those kind of physical things. But we don't know what the value of the research there is yet. I think there are probably many, many labs in all of our countries that do work, and they work for many years on problems with making little to no progress on them. And then one day there's this spectacular discovery, sometimes purely by chance. 
if we don't expose ourselves to the the possibility of discovering those things, then we may never get there. And because it has some very unique physical characteristics about it, I believe that there's value in doing research there. You know, there you you probably know better than I, and there, there are many different uh, postulations of of mechanisms that go on with biological things and with other physical things, with uh, materials research, things that we don't understand well enough uh, that we want to understand better by doing that work where we remove one of those variables, the, you know, the most of the gravity. So I think it's just having the opportunity to work in that different environment and the possibility of the value of that uh, if you just look at the pure scientific aspect of it. And I think that's what makes being able to go to the space station as a laboratory valuable. It, it, it's not been used as it yet, but it could be a way station. And uh, that's an issue of orbital mechanics and other, and, and, and launch site inclinations that you can launch too. And, and Dr. Kerwin, I know, has a comment here. He knows. A comment and a, and a modest suggestion. I, I agree with you. The, the, uh, the uh, crowning accomplishments of the International Space Station have not yet been achieved. They are in the future, hopefully in the near future. When we finished with Skylab, we asked ourselves, how come we had such a successful life sciences program when NASA's previous history had not indicated that at all? We'd done virtually nothing. Uh, and the reason was that we were finally given to life sciences top priority on a program, enough funding, a dedicated crew, uh, all the resources we needed to mount a campaign, I almost said a surge, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to accomplish a great deal by focusing our resources on a particular mission. And I think if we did that on space station, mounted a campaign for an expedition or maybe two with a dedicated crew selected for their skills in life sciences, international goes without saying, uh, uh, and focusing on countermeasures, uh, uh, physiological mechanisms, and medical care, we'd be a lot sooner a, a, a lot closer to being ready for those uh, for those planetary expeditions, and we would crown the International Space Station with a real success. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Jeff or Julie? Did you get a mic? Uh, sure, Julie Robinson from NASA. I just wanted to address that big question of what makes Space Station unique with a couple of words. We've never had this capability, this extent of scientific equipment to address so many different kinds of scientific questions available with this number of crew for this long duration in space. And those are the three things you need to do research in the same way that you do research on the ground. So we have capable laboratories. We can do experiments over many years. We can have um, feedback between those carrying out the experiments so that as they observe things that are unexpected, they turn around in the next week without it being planned years in advance, do the follow-on investigation, and so that we are able to iterate and do science in the way that science needs to be done. And we've never really had that capability in any of the previous space stations. Okay. I'll tell you what, we get, we'll do one more question, and then I'll kind of wrap up, and then, then we'll call it an end to the panel. So, Jeff? Um, a few years back, there was, for a while, the concept of uh, setting up a, uh, a non-governmental organization to manage the scientific operations on the station, sort of after the example of the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute, where basically the astronomers, the users of the telescope, set the scientific priorities, and, and NASA is responsible for logistics and so on. Um, that idea was uh, was not pursued, but I wonder if now that we're we're really looking at the completion of the construction phase and going up to a six person crew, if this might be a time to reconsider that idea for the scientific management of the station. Any panel members have any comments on the NGO for space station, non governmental organization to to run space station and research? I think it's, for the Hubble, it's been fantastic. I think, again, maybe the problem a little bit on station, and it goes back to your, your first question in the back that we started with, was when we talk about a single uh, idea or unique aspect of space station, there isn't one. I mean, there's not the, the uh, you know, in the vernacular of today, there's not the winning application for space station that is the home run. And, but I think what Space Station is, is it's so diverse, it has the ability to satisfy many objectives, 
but then that's also a, a, um, a negative for it because then it's not the world's best transportation facility, it's not the world's best research biological facility, it's not the world's best materials research area, it's a multidiscipline thing. And I think that becomes a problem even if you put an NGO on top because now the disciplines are so unique and so diverse it's difficult to figure out a way to manage where Hubble is least focused on astronomy and is within one area that can there can be some consensus. So I think part of the problem with station is it is so diverse and it's so complex it's hard to find a single thing that's, that's there. Now let me let me just kind of just summarize quickly what I heard from this panel today, and, and you were very lucky to get a chance to hear these folks and hear their positions. The things they talked about first were culture, you know, language, they talked about sustainability, they talked about food, and they talked about engineering design. And, and those are all things that we would have done before previously individually as a country, but we have never had to do as an international community. And then we had to do it in an unbelievably tough environment. Flying in space requires tremendous precision, and you can't have a mistake. I remember talking to the Russians about orbital mechanics, and we were discussing something, and the translator was translating it wrong from the physics principles, and it wasn't right, and I told the translator it's not right. So then I wrote out the mathematical equation for orbital mechanics and passed it to my Russian colleague who immediately knew what it was, and then we started talking a language we could understand, and it was math. But we had to have that precision, and you cannot miss things. So the cultural stuff had to be truly ironed out, had to be worked out. The language, they developed a common language as we heard from the panel, which was amazing. And what forced that was the technical challenge of operating in space. So what we've done with Station so far is we've learned to live in space as an international community, which is huge. Um, we've also developed friendships. I will tell you that I have more international friends now than I've ever had in my entire life, and I mean true friends. There is no question that if I needed something, I would be tempted to call them maybe even before my own friends here in the U.S. in some cases because that stress of working together, that pull for the space station is, is huge, and that's, that's a very big thing. You know, we also learned about engineering. We solve the same physical problems in different ways. We also learned to work as a control center, which is new. Some of these guys didn't see it. But now we have not only the Russian control center, the U.S. control center, we have a Japanese control center, we have a control center in Canada, we have the uh, POIC in Marshall, uh, we have the one in ESA, and all these control centers now figured out how to work together, which I didn't know if we would ever do it. We worked it out bilaterally when we worked well with the Russians, but then when we added the other control centers, it became a very different problem. We're about ready to see the same thing on board Space Station. Three people are, are one group, but now when you add three more, and now there's six folks on board Space Station, I think that'll be another big dynamic learning experience that'll, that'll occur, and you guys can probably tell me more about that than I know. From a science standpoint, we talked a little bit, uh, I think uh, Boris talked a little bit about the, uh, the bio-risk experiment and the, uh, having biological samples on the outside of space station. That's very promising. We're also doing a lot with salmonella, where we're learning that, that we can essentially salmonella mutates more rapidly in space. So we think we may have developed a vaccine based on uh, the samples returned from space station for salmonella. We've also done one for another uh, uh, another disease on board space station. So what we're doing is we're taking a unique aspect of space station and, and using that test environment to drive out different results that change our theories about bacteria and viruses that we can then apply to the earth. So there may be some very things, very important things that are, that are happening there. So I think space station is a truly unique platform. And then kind of the, at the end, the discussion was how do we use that platform? And we have a very small window to go use that. We're not gonna get all the perfect equipment up there, but we should go look at what's on board space, space station today. We have an optical microscope, we have small centrifuges, we have a gas chromatograph, we have a whole variety of scientific equipment that is a very well outfitted research lab. It may not be perfect, but the challenge to us is how can we use that equipment the way it is in space station, not have to fly something else up new, but use that equipment to push science in the next direction. And that's our challenge as we go forward. So again, I think uh, it was a very uh, interesting uh, discussion. I want to thank all the panel members, and I want to thank the audience for their questions. Thanks.